So welcome back. Welcome to 2018. <laughs> so, um, usually somewhere around this time of year, I end up talking about New Year's resolutions. Um, everybody makes them sometimes. Um, and it's actually a good time to reflect on what you want to do for the coming year. So if it's not a resolution, sometimes you can think of it as setting an intention. So um, I got the idea when preparing for tonight's lecture and reading through the Vimalakirti Sutra that um, this portion of the teaching is boiled down to a single word. And instead of um, making a resolution, you might take some inspiration from that word. So the word, though, will remain a mystery until we get to it. So. What's that? Is it bow? Bowel? No. <laughs> bow. Bow. Oh, bow, no. <laughs> <laughs> Different word. Um, and I think um, one of the problems that we have with New Year's resolutions is sometimes they are unrealistic or they're so aspirational that we haven't laid a groundwork or foundation for them. So some of those same ideas show up here. Um, in this portion of the text, so um, it's maybe helpful to keep that in the back of our mind as we think about what resolution we made or are thinking of making. We still have time to make a resolution if you haven't made one. Um, and how you go about doing it. So some of it I think is cultural for us as Americans in terms of how we go about doing things. Um, tends to be very all or nothing, very extreme. That tends to be our style. So all of our diets are very extreme. Exercise regimens tend to be very extreme. Um, anything new that we want to do tends to be, you know, you really dive in. And that, it might sound strange, but that's not always the best way. So um, hopefully this portion sheds some light on that from a, a Buddhist perspective. So we'll jump in. Um, so we get to this section, uh, we talked about the end of last year, where Pure Lands come from, what do they rely upon, and what are their purpose. So partially this is one of those sections of the sutra where the sutra is asking questions that I never asked before, but when you really think about it, you're like, oh, that, I maybe never thought of it that way. Um, so one of the things I really like about Buddhist texts like this is Sometimes we ask questions and we don't understand a concept for a long time, or we've read a concept for a long time and we just take it for granted and we never asked anything deeper of it. And um, Buddha lands or pure lands are one of those concepts that I probably just said, okay, and kept reading and said, that's what it's like, um, but never considered the origin. I didn't, I didn't approach it like a scientist. Um, where do these come from? What do they depend on? Um, where are they located? And that kind of thing. So this uh, portion of the text gets starts to ask those questions and answer them. But keep in mind, th this first chapter has a lot of, um, in my ongoing comparison with Shakespeare, there's a lot of foreshadowing. So everything talked about here gets discussed in more depth further on in the text, but it's helpful to lay the foundation now so that when we get to that portion, we have some idea of what we're talking about. So it's not a deep dive initially. So initially we're, we're skimming um, the topics that are going to be covered. Um, so the it's helpful to also remember um, the basis of the inquiry. So here we have Jewel Accumulation asking questions, not only for himself, but for others that are present. And not only because he has the question, but there's this sort of, um, maybe from an American standpoint, like a wink and a nod between himself and the Buddha, of like, you know, you ask that question so I have an opportunity to talk about this. Or we're gonna set this, uh, create the, the environment where that question's asked and the people get the benefit of it. Um, not that um, he's going, oh, I wonder what question I'm gonna ask the Buddha today. Um, and just said, well, uh, I'll ask this. Or this has really been weighing on me heavily and for many years and now's my time to, to answer. Um, so there's some foreshadowing here about um, 
jewel accumulations, maybe we could say true identity and true intent. So it's not um, his question alone. It's really a deep opportunity for um, the Buddha to answer. Um, and he's just providing the framework for that, that teaching to come out. So that's also kind of helpful to keep in mind. Um, so the question here isn't just for himself, it's for the 500 people he brought. It's not just for, um, you know, even the people who we brought with them, but those who were already assembled. Um, the text has already told us it's not just for the monks who were there, but for a variety of different, you know, sentient beings that have gathered. So there's um, people hearing it at different levels based on their understanding, but also their need. And probably in the same way that I've read this text many times and never um, thought as deep about this portion as I have when I thought, well, how, how will I explain it? <laughs> it provides me a different view of the teaching as well. So we have all the different perspectives depending on who you are and what your background is when it comes to, to this portion. Um, so the question is, what are the practices by which a land is purified? So if you have a regular Buddha land, how do you actually purify one or create one? And we see here that the text is talking about pure lands coming together, um, having been brought together under the canopies, right? So you've got all these different pure lands brought together. Um, they're all now visible for people to see. And it's not an abstract concept for them during this time. So you can actually look up and, okay, there's a pure land, there's a pure land. All of them are right here. Um, it's probably equivalent to seeing the Milky Way, right? It's a very clear night and it's perfect for star viewing. And so here you have all of these, um, what were before abstract concepts, and now the Buddha has an opportunity to make it very clear um, and sort of brush away all of this um, conceptualization and really get down to what do they rely on. And at least for me, the answer was surprising. So um, asking that question, what do they rely on, where do they come from, it's a good question. Right? Um, if that's a goal in practice, is good to know um, where do they come from. So this is a, uh, where do babies come from? Uh, pure land version, <laughs> questioning. Um, so the Buddha answers, he says, dual accumulation, the categories of sentient beings are the bodhisattvas pure lands. So this, initially I skimmed over and um, I had to reread and realize that there's a lot of depth to that statement. So the categories of sentient beings are the bodhisattvas pure lands. Why is this? It says bodhisattvas acquire the Buddha lands according to the sentient beings they convert. They acquire the Buddha lands according to the sentient beings they discipline. They acquire the Buddha lands according to what country or what land the sentient beings need to enter into Buddha wisdom. They acquire the Buddha lands according to what land sentient beings need to generate the roots for becoming bodhisattvas. So it goes through these various categories. Um, conversion, disciplining, what people need in order to actually understand wisdom, and how, what sort of pure land they would need in order to generate the future conditions for them themselves to become a bodhisattva. So these are all of the um, basis for uh, the creation or the dependence of a pure land. So why is this? Because the bodhisattva's acquisition of the pure land is entirely for the benefit of sentient beings. So this is a good point. Um, Buddha's, my previous understanding when I was younger was, okay, you become a Buddha, you get a pure land. So that's your like hangout. <laughs> and so it's decorated with, you know, you know, maybe you have, there's a Bodhisattva interior decorator. Oh, you've become a Buddha now, congratulations. How would you like to change the drapes? And you know, what kind of flooring would you like? It's HD, HD TV um, for your Buddha land. Um, but here, in fact, it says that's not the, the purpose, it's entirely for the benefit of sentient beings. Which means, now the Buddha says, well, it's not for me, this pure land is for others, so I'm going to make it as comfortable and useful to the people who come. I have no interest in the pure land, other than what's going to benefit other people. So you would never buy a house like this, right? You would never go buy a house, you'd say, well, you know, I want a nice dining area, I might have some friends over. But you wouldn't decorate it or buy it or create it or build it just for your guests. You know, do you want a bedroom? No, no, no. <laughs> just to make it perfect for hosting. Right? So this is going to be like the absolute um, most beneficial building you create for others. 
Um, so it says, it is like a man who wants a, to build a palace on empty land, who is able to build it according to the, his wish without hindrance. So the Bodhisattva manifests this pure land strictly for the benefit of others with no obstruction, no hindrance whatsoever. Um, the Bodhisattvas are like this. In order to accomplish the salvation of sentient beings, they vow to acquire the Buddha countries. The vow to acquire Buddha land is not done in empty space. It is not done... Um, you don't vow to have a pure land just to have a pure land. You vow to have a pure land because it's beneficial for helping others. Um, I'm trying to think what... You know, we don't have... Usually, if someone builds a memorial to themselves during their lifetime, it's not... It's not totally for the benefit of others. It hits uh, some degree, you know, let me educate you about me. Um, so here is it's the opposite. Once you attain this goal, the pure land is something you manifest strictly in order to help others. Which also means that if there's no others to help, the pure land no longer exists. Um, so that also becomes interesting. Uh, so it then goes through all the different ways in which the pure lands are useful. Um, how they are dependent and um, on what they depend. And so the foreshadowing here is according to the sentient beings they convert, um, the ones they discipline, um, the ones that need to acquire the Buddha wisdom and for becoming bodhisattvas. So convert and discipline are um, loaded terms in English. So convert here doesn't mean convert from some other religion. It means those in whom the Buddhist ideas have awakened. So people have been turned towards the teaching, they have developed an interest, they have awakened the Bodhi mind in some, in some fashion. So for them, right, there has been a conversion from maybe a wayward path to a spiritual path, or they have, you know, turned towards doing practice, away from not doing practice, as more of that meaning. Um, since you're being, say, disciplined, this isn't, you were naughty on the playground, so you get, you get the paddle. Oh, when I was in grade school, they had a really big paddle. You can't do that anymore, right? But, well, it was sad. You could hear the other kids, like, in the basement getting whacked. It was like a lesson to everyone else, so. It's not that type of discipline. <laughs> <laughs> so here it's more, um, more detailed teaching. So what sort of things in the practice need to be corrected or expanded upon? Um, what is the best, you can think of it like a meditation retreat. So what's the ideal meditation retreat? So probably here in Oregon, it would be somewhere under tall redwood trees and giant ferns and, you know, a beautiful, uh, you know, stream nearby, and, you, know, you know, a constant 68 degrees, which is, you know, most of the year, the year almost. <laughs> um, some very lush greenery. Um, so the, it has that connotation. What's the best place to do the teaching? What's the best environment to be created? So this is the, the key here more than hmm, discipline has a more firm tone. So that's not what's being discussed. Um, and then what do they need in order to enter into the Buddha's wisdom? So here they're talking more about prajna, like the actual wisdom of the Buddha. So your practice may be good. Your meditation may be good. But we may have an obstacle into actually understanding um, those specific texts. What is wisdom of the Buddha as realized? So the Pure Land, one of the purposes is to actually help develop that aspect. So within Buddhist literature, that's a, a whole category of texts. And they're not the easiest to understand. A lot of it seems very paradoxical. Um, a lot of it probably reads more like... Um, a graduate seminar of philosophy than it does in spiritual practice. So if you pick up those texts without a foundation, they don't make a lot of sense necessarily. Or you'd say, well, where's the meditation instruction here? And so that's not the, the purpose. So here it may be um, fine-tuning an understanding or fine-tuning a level of insight that's happening in the pure mind. And then finally, um, for those sentient beings who need to generate the roots for becoming bodhisattvas. So um, here is again a, a much deeper level of teaching. How do you actually enter into the bodhisattva path? And um, you may even be a very high level practitioner. You may only have you know a few lifetimes left or rebirths left. 
but how do you actually really get into the you know bodhisattva practice? So um, those are the you know general broad brush categories of the pure lands and why they're created. So it's actually very helpful philosophically because we have texts that describe you know the pure lands and in it are discussed you know every day there's lectures and the Buddhist teaching is constantly given um, but if you even read the description of Amida's pure land it's more about rebirth there rather than what exactly is taught um, so here now we have sort of a framework for what does the pure land depend upon which is very interesting for me anyways, it's a very interesting um, component so we're looking at how you get a, a pure land um, their purpose in supporting, aiding, assisting, transforming sentient beings, looking at the very specific needs of sentient beings. Um, so this is, you know, what is the job of a Buddha? Um, and this is also important because if you think from one of the, a lot of early texts, when I first started studying Buddhism, translations weren't very good, and there are a lot of erroneous assumptions. Um, and a lot of early writers understood enlightenment as nirvana's extinction. You just poof, you're gone. Um, and that idea had been parroted in a lot of a lot of texts. It's gotten better now, um, but in the late '80s there wasn't you know a, a great deal of, of good Buddhist literature in English. So if you have that, what wasn't being answered, I think in a lot of texts was well, what do Buddhists do? Right, and so here you see an ongoing um, teaching that's happening, and an ongoing transformation that's happening, and it's strictly since their own um, transformation is complete, it's strictly a response to the needs of others. So that part is is very interesting. So there's an ongoing wisdom response to the needs and creation of the proper um, environment. So. As I was reading this, I thought, well, it's very interesting because technically we live in a pure land, right? This is considered Shakyamuni's pure land. This is the perfect place for sentient beings to be transformed. And it should create within us, within us a greater appreciation for our life, that we have this opportunity, um, that we have, as human beings, an environment where um, there's roughly equal amounts of happiness and unhappiness, but in the middle, there's a, just a lot of okay. There's not uh, generally every day a massive upheaval for us, a massive emotional trauma, uh, or a massive, you know, every day isn't you got news that you won the lottery. Um, so we have these highs and we have lows, but for the most part, we're, we're in the middle, which gives us a lot of opportunity to reflect. It gives us a lot of opportunity to practice but that time is still finite. So we have an urgency as well, uh, but not so urgent that we don't think we can't you know, accomplish certain uh, goals that we have. So um, if we look at life this way, then we say, okay, this is in many ways a perfect place of practice. We don't put off our practice to, well, that's for something later. Um, we don't walk around thinking, um, well, if it only it was better, if only it was, um, you know, as described in the text, or I don't have the right conditions to practice, so I'm not going to practice yet. So in fact, we do have the right conditions. Right? Everything about our world is, is the right condition to practice. Um, everything that we see in the news is a good <laughs> reason to practice and be reminded of why practice is useful. Um, so this part, I think, is very interesting. Right? So how do we, how do, you, do we even view our, our world? Is it in a way that's helpful to us, or is it a, another obstacle or hindrance? So um, looking at the pure land this way, I think, is it's helpful. So if we go on to the next um, section, I think this is a good opportunity just to remind us that you know the pure land is something here and now, not something far off and remote. Um, it doesn't have to be only this, op this I guess, aspiration of something that we we'll be reborn into. It can be um, right here. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, a beautiful, huge temple on a mountaintop 
in a far off land. It can be wherever you are studying the Dharma. It can be, as we will find out later, uh, someone's bedroom. <laughs> it can be a garden, um, right? The, where this text is taking place, they don't have a roof. It's outside. So um, this is before the glittering, beautiful temples and statuary and text even. Um, they're just going to down the road to a garden to hear the teaching. So there, there's the pure land. From the, I'm just thinking about the Buddha's life. This is a pure land, and his realization of his life would probably be a question after that. Mm-hmm. And the means by which he began the practice was mm-hmm. by seeing death. Yes. So it wasn't. So we need those reminders, right? right. So it's not, um, you know, it's very easy, especially I think in the West for me. Um, we read Pure Land and we overlay cultural ideas of heaven yeah. right of what it's going to be oh it's going to be this wonderful place and there's no suffering and it's all wonderful but in fact some degree of realization of impermanence uh, realization of suffering realization of obstacles hindrance pain is fuel those are lessons those are things that we actually need so it's not um, you know even if you look at all of our institutions worldwide for building peace and our assumptions about you know peaceful pro- that all came out of right incredible pain suffering war um, and so to some in a weird way we need that right that's that's just as necessary as good times what is it in, it's in this text too where later on the other bird through the world comes and it's just an ambrosia right it's just the sense people are able to get from there because they're like, we are. <laughs> well, so we like we need a little bit more <laughs> like in a way um, so it's very clear that the Buddha lands are dependent on the level of attainment of uh-huh. the individual so yeah. um, the one practice space may not be suitable for us and yeah. the same way that our practice space may not be suitable for beings that are more accomplished um, and that's okay okay um, every time I have to go to an elementary school, I'm reminded of this classroom is not conducive for me because I don't fit in the desks. <laughs> <laughs> and periodically, there's someone's going, well, let's just sit in the, the small chairs because we can't find big chairs. So you have a bunch of adults sitting with their knees up to their, you know, and they're talking about what's going to happen at the school and that kind of thing. And, you know, everyone's very serious, but hardly is thinking this is just really comical. <laughs> because this is not an appropriate classroom, right? This isn't, that's not an appropriate pure land for me. It's a very appropriate pure land for kindergartners, first graders. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, infinitely difficult. Even in Japan, uh, unfortunately, most of the doorways are 180 centimeters, and I'm taller than that. So um, I, many times, right there. <laughs> and it's just out in my field of vision. So they just, yeah, yeah, you end up flat. Um, so all of these environments are conducive to someone. <laughs> Going back to what you were saying about the cultural overlay, it's not just um, the West either. Uh, because in the Chinese idea of Pure Land, I found something out while I was in Japan with a bit of free time on my hands. <laughs> um, I was looking at some of the Qing Dynasty prayers mm-hmm. about the Pure Land, and one of them was changed after um, Western influence. So the current version that's used in probably 99% of Chinese Buddhist temples says something about ascending golden staircases to heaven, to oh, the pure land. Oh, interesting. Um, to which I always thought, no sutra ever says that you go to pure land on a golden staircase. No. That, that's yeah. definitely to heaven. Yeah. So I eventually <laughs> found another version of it dating just maybe 20 years prior. Um, and that one says in, there's nothing, no reference about staircases, golden staircases. Instead it says, it is a place where all virtuous people come to practice. Mm. So I thought, okay, that, that is definitely a lot more in line with the sutras than yes. golden staircases. Yes. But <laughs> historically it was also when Christianity was booming in China too, so I thought it must have been some sort of influence and mm-hmm. response. Mm-hmm. That, that's actually, I, I think, very interesting and, and helpful to keep in mind because you know, one of the first there's a, a very pretty famous temple in Shikoku, and they have, as you walk in, all of these, you know, um, images of the hell realms and, and this kind of thing, and being judged, and 
Um, initially, the first time I visited, I didn't pay a lot of attention to that. I just said, okay, interesting. And then later I read that it's actually a fairly famous, you know, it's all carved and painted. And so the second time I went, I paid more attention. And um, it's not the Buddhist vision of the hell realms or the, or the heavenly realms. It's actually straight from Chinese mythology. Um, and all of it is, you know, the Jade Emperor and his palace and then, you know, and so there's this external sort of Taoist Confucian art, and then you actually go through the gates here and hit the Buddhist temple. Um, but that cultural overlay, that um, probably even by that time, you know, Chinese or Okinawan influence and, and seeing that was a more spectacular and easily, I think, more easy to for people to grasp onto as like an allegory than some of the Buddhist explanations, you know, if you're going to render them in art. Um, same thing in, in Christianity. Um, people talk about heaven and hell um, as if it's in the Bible and it actually is all in Dante's Inferno. Yeah. Right? So here you have, you know, a, a work of fiction that is so heavily influenced um, people thinking about religion when it's not actually in there, right? It's not actually in the text. But uh, it shows up you know, even in sermons. I'm like, well, that's very curious because, in fact, <laughs> as I recall, that's not there. Uh, yeah, is it actually up there? Where up there? <laughs> Where is up in space? Just got yeah. here. Um, so, those are, I, I think, uh, some of the language we just have to keep in mind periodically if we run across. Sure. Question. Because my understanding and probably misunderstanding that uh, the source of the pure land or, or Buddha land or Buddha verse is actually the mind of the Buddha. Yes. Yes? Yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, You're like you, uh, a paragraph ahead of me, yes. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, so, okay. I was asking, I was going to ask you to elaborate. Yeah. Okay. But that is, that yeah, is yeah. The, the, the source. So, actually, uh, we'll, we'll skip um, ahead, but it, there's a very interesting, um, in the commentary, um, this line that says, in fact, the pure land is something that is, um, there's two causes, the mind of the Buddha and the need of the sentient being. So it's the Buddha's mind responding to the sentient being's need. But without the need, then the mind doesn't create it. Need to. Right. But without the mind, it can't be created. It can't respond. There is this, you know, cause and effect relationship. Um, even at that level. So in, so in the sense of when we ask the Buddhists to remain in the world, or, or is that part we're asking Buddhists to remain in that cause and effect relationship between the great and the pure lines, the cause and the teachings, and that's being able to receive it? So that's like, it comes back to Adistana. In a way, yes. So, um, and I skipped ahead, but there is the, um, <laughs> there is the, um, skillful means of the Buddha to respond to the needs of the sentient being. That that creates the pure life. So in ancient times, yeah, even depending on who you ask today, Koyasan is considered a pure life. That here is a place of a pure practice because um, it's not us asking and them saying, well, okay, it's it's us creating a connection. Mm-hmm. Um, the Buddhas are already ready and willing to respond it's us creating the, the connection that helps us actually be there. Um, so if you think of it from, um, in terms of being in Japan, being here, the more we think about that, then we actually do make the journey, we visit the place, and the place is transformative. Um, the place is transformative regardless. I mean, almost everyone I've, I've met who's been feels uh, that it's someplace special. Um, that's also true for many of the, you know, we talked before about the various holy mountains in China. Um, you know, people visit, I, coming down, they look different. You know, they, they've been changed by the place. So um, it's not, right, it's not all only this far away idea. This someplace that we're, you know, reborn into from the lotus flower. Right? It's also something that we have now. Uh, we have now because we've made the connection, because we've done the practice. So that's the, there's all this foreshadowing here. There's actually, that, that point is actually very quite, quite interesting for me. So having 
jumped ahead, we'll go back. <laughs> but I must actually jump ahead further because otherwise I won't get to the uh, the single word that sums up. <laughs> we'll run out of time tonight. Um, so the in the text it's point thirteen. So dual accumulation. You should understand that sincerity is the Buddhist Bodhisattva's pure land. When the Bodhisattva attains Buddhahood, it is sentient beings who do not falter. Oh, excuse me. It is sentient beings who do not flatter and lie that come to be born in this country. So there's your single word, sincerity. Um, so it's all of these practices, um, all the practices that are about to be enumerated, rely on sincerity. How do you do any practice? Um, are you doing the practice? And we do this day to day, right? There's a lot of flattery. There's a lot of like white lies, we would say, right? There's a lot of um, praising others to get something that we want. And it's very clear that, um, you know, being born in the pure land only comes about from people who've given that up, right? There's no more flattery. There's no more lying. There is real sincerity. And sincerity um, here, um, is probably a very good catch-all term for all the different practices of becoming a bodhisattva and then how the bodhisattva conducts themselves. Um, and if you think about it, right, what do you do? If you do something with sincerity, it's a, it's a degree of honesty. It's a degree of, um, you know, being very real. It's a degree of, um, you know, you've, you've left behind the guile and the pretense and you're allowed to be, you know, truly who you are. And the Vimalakirti Sutra has a lot of teaching about that. You know, can you be who you really are? Who are you really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And especially too, you know, who are you when you don't think anyone's looking? Um, so all of those concepts come in, especially the next chapter. We're getting closer. I promise. <laughs> but that really, that part really comes out. Um, but that most of us find very difficult to do. We feel like we have to put on a face, we have to put on a certain perspective, or we have to project someone that we want, that we think others want, rather than to just be relaxed, right? To be sincere. So that is not in any, uh, you know, when I was going through college, it was always, you know, make sure you have a good resume, make sure you're dressed this way, you're selling yourself, you have to make yourself marketable. No one said just be sincere. Right? It, was, it was all this pretense that you had to create. Uh, it was all this, you know, use the right words and positioning, and you became a product that was marketed. Um, and there are, you know, if you do, I mean, think about products that don't need to be marketed because people just know it's a good product. Or they just say, here's my product, it works, it's well made, it's well made. if you'd like to buy it, this is when we're open. Right? No, no commercials like that, very few. Uh, but certain things, people, right, it, they have their own reviews and you, it doesn't need to be sold. But if you look around, um, you know, society, how much is just this pretense? There's very little sincerity. And when we see real sincerity, it's sort of shocking. Um, and then that ends up on the news. Wow, this person's really sincere, or very humble, or that's, you know, seems very genuine. Um, and that genuineness, we've had a long string of that ever since, you know, probably the end of the summer till now, where, you know, we thought someone was one way, and then we find out, well, they did all these things, and now they're giving up their position, resigning, and, you know. So um, that sincerity is, um, you know, very easily can be your New Year's resolution, right? Can you be more sincere um, in everything you do? And then what you'll find is the next section of what are the practices of a bodhisattva become much easier. Right? Sometimes they seem very hard. So people say, well, should Buddhism, I thought Buddhism was simple. I thought, you know, everything <laughs> should be very simple. But then all these texts are very complex. So here we come back to the simplicity and right? sincerity. Not well, simple. But what we need then is, it's easy to say, okay, sincerity, I'll wear that t-shirt. Sincerity. <laughs> I'm going to have mine in a, like, a graffiti art. You know? Then people are wearing sincere hats, you know. Um, and then they've lost it already. 
so the reason we, we kind of ex- expand those terms, we, we blow them up and say, okay, the 10,000 foot view and then the close up um, are to help us zero in on the areas that we have created allowed weaknesses to arise because we say, well, I'm sincere, yeah. And then we get to some point where we're like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Or I haven't thought about that piece. Or I didn't realize that's connected to those things. Um, so what are, um, what is this huge challenge of simplicity? Um, so the text goes on, it says, a profound mind is a Bodhisattva's pure land. When the Bodhisattva attains Buddhahood, it is sentient beings who are complete in merit that come to be born in his country. It makes sense, right? If you're, pure land is a place of teaching, then the people that are going to come there are people that are pure and sincere and ready to be, you know, go to the next level or, or learn what they need to learn. Uh, it's much the same as uh, you probably had friends at some point in your life that are no longer close acquaintances because maybe you changed or you no longer engaged in certain behavior and they no longer found you interesting. <laughs> so your world is different from their world. Um, when I was growing up, there were a lot of people in, in involved in some pretty shady things. And since I didn't do that, they thought I wasn't very interesting. So our world separated. So now I had this this pure land and they had a pure land of crime and drug dealing. And, eh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and mine was very boring because it was books and studying and going to school, right? So these worlds didn't, didn't match anymore. So it's not as if anyone's excluded. Um, this is more the natural self-selection that's happening all the time. So the mind of Bodhi, Bodhicitta, the intent to achieve per- perfect enlightenment, is the Bodhisattva's pure land. When the Bodhisattva achieves Buddhahood, sentient beings of the Mahayana come to be born in this country. So if the Buddha has developed Bodhicitta, this aspiration, then those who gather in his pure land have also developed Bodhicitta, this, this aspiration. So like attracts like. In many ways it's very simple. So development of bodhicitta, this is, um, I had this conversation with someone recently, they were interested in Shingon and they said, why, um, you know, why is it hard to find or why does it seem um, difficult or if you compare the, um, you know, Tibetan Buddhist experience versus you know, a lot of Shingon temples in the United States. Um, so I you know, went through the normal, well, Japan is still has its own country and people haven't been cast out, so they don't have such a strong... Uh, mission necessarily in many ways but secondarily um, oftentimes I think there's a I w- I'll call it a language barrier and not differences between actual languages but the language of intent so my experience so this is purely my opinion it's not my, text, my experience is um, Buddhist practice in a lot of Asian countries is looked at as something more formal than the way it's looked at in the United States, where here we might say, I want to do some meditation or I'm interested in meditation, and we think of it like a hobby or an interest. And more serious practice in Asia is looked at as a profession. I hate to use the word profession, but like this is a full-time um, investment of my life And it's not just for me, it also involves um, giving back to the temple, the teacher that trains me, the community, and you're giving your life to someone or a cause or a reason. So there's more involved than I just want to learn meditation. So that part sometimes we miss in our cultural context of Buddhist practice. Um, You know, if you go even one state over to Hawaii (laughs) and you go to the temple, um, you know, the, whomever's at that temple, probably if you really engage them in conversation, looks at that temple as their life, right? They have dedicated their life, you know, until they die to maintaining it, to maintaining the community around it. And, um, you know, most everything that they do is associated with service to that goal. Um, and that sometimes isn't a perspective that we see as often here. So uh, sometimes when people approach, you know, oh, here's a teacher from Japan, here's a teacher from somewhere in Asia, and they say, well, I'm interested in this, and they don't get the response 
that they're expecting initially, sometimes there's, that's the language barrier. It's the language of our intent, of our underlying interest and motivation, and not just um, the actual, you know, English versus whatever language. So um, here, I think you see that same idea mimicked in the text that um, those who have generated the aspiration to achieve enlightenment are born, you know, in that pure land. Those who haven't don't get there. It's not that the door's closed, it's just you haven't found the right door. And sometimes um, I think the teaching there exists that that difference. Um, that's not to say that each shouldn't learn the other's language, but that is a kind of a built-in, I think, language barrier. Uh, let's see here. So it goes on to discuss the ten precepts. Um, so you can either say, only ten? Gosh, that's easy. Or ten? I thought Buddhism was easy. Why is there just one? He just said sincerity. So it depends on your on your perspective. Um, so what the text is trying to make clear here is that um, these are um, chapter headings. I'll put it that way. And there's a lot of detail under each one. And in the rest of the text, they get, um, I was going to say blown up, no, expanded in great detail. Um, but um, here, we go over the major uh, 10. So um, what I want you to take away, right? Think of the concept of sincerity. So you have 10 things. The first one, Donna, giving, charity. Um, you could look at it like, oh, let me go check my Fitbit. How many, uh, how many Donna points did I accumulate today? Now let me go online and compare to my friends and see, see who won. Um, that is not that sort of thing. That if you're acting from a place of sincerity, these are things that you just naturally do. You just find yourself doing these things. It's not that you have to look at the list and remind yourself, or what am I supposed to do? <laughs> so if the sincerity is there, it just happens. And in this way, it's not um, even specifically Buddhist. This is transition you know, transcends every culture. You're going to find, you know, angels and bodhisattvas around the world that are just out of sincerity act in this way. They don't have to be told. Um, but we need the teaching because there's always weak weaknesses, no matter how, you know, much we're sort of self-taught. Um, the point of the teaching is to help us look even a little bit deeper. Um, and the first one, Charity, Donna, of course, we just passed our season of giving. Um, so I've been asked a lot, you know, did, does Hannah bring you everything you wanted? <laughs> I said, I guess I didn't ask for anything. <laughs> so whatever I got was good. <laughs> um, and then you, the second you hear people saying, well, I gave someone this, but they didn't seem to like it or they didn't seem to appreciate it or someone gave me that but they, they don't really know me very well because they know, should know I don't do that. And so we see this um, undermining already this sense of giving. Um, and here, especially in Buddhist practice, the giving um, was a good opportunity to say, sometimes you go in, especially Western temples, and the, the donation box says dana. That's very incorrect. So <laughs> um, the idea here is giving without attachment. And um, especially around, you know, Christmas, there's a lot of giving with attachment. There's a lot of giving and, you know, I'm going to give you this and I want you to use it this way. Um, or someone gave me this and this isn't what I wanted. And now there's lack of sense. Like, oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. And then it gets re-gifted or something. Um, and so then it, it lacks sincerity. So part of this, I think, is helpful to go through um, and look at... Um, what does it mean? And giving here is giving with, with no benefit to yourself. Right? So that, that's hard to do. Uh, so periodically here, you know, there's an anonymous donor and they just wanted to benefit this charity. And, um, other times, you know, you get your name on the wall and, and the impetus to give is, well, I want my name 
can I get my name higher? And then there's classifications of donors. And, and that's okay to some degree, but it shouldn't be our goal, right? It shouldn't be the goal to, like, I want my name bigger than everyone else's, and, you know, for all time. Um, so can we give without, um, you know, no strings attached type giving? Um, can we give, and then what are we giving, right? So we, we've, we've covered this before, of, you know, the classifications of, of giving, material goods, giving, um, the teaching, and then, you know, the highest of giving fearlessness, right? Can we give that to people? How do you give fearlessness to people? Um, we have a lot of people in the country that are fearful, fearful that they're not going to earn enough, fearful they're not going to have enough to eat, fearful they may lose their job. How do you give um, fearlessness to your country? Right? Imagine someone ran on that platform. I want to give fearlessness to Americans. I hope someone steals that run and do it, actually. <laughs> uh, use that. Uh, but that's not how we, we go about right? How many people are actually in a position to help because they're they're acting from true, you know, selfless giving. Imagine that senator. So we don't we don't see that very often. Um, so it goes through. You know, there's a huge. It's it's as with many things, endless, right? So as the teaching has evolved, um, people have analyzed all the different ways that giving it manifests and where we go wrong when doing it. So, um, I just heard that recently. They, someone wanted to give a car to a niece or nephew, but they were afraid of what they would do with it after they gave it to them. So they decided not to give it to them. So. But if you gave it to them, it's for their benefit. So if they, okay. <laughs> so, um, morality, sila. Morality, again, maybe mm, heavy baggage in English on morality. So really it's maintaining the precepts. So are we, you know, even more simplified, are we maintaining our sincerity? Uh, um, is that how, or is it a show? So that's a good one. Um, exertion, vidya, vigor. Are we vigorous in our practice? Are we bringing some energy to it? Um, are we drinking coffee and then meditating so we can stay awake? Or are we just drinking coffee? <laughs> so the vigor in our practice. Uh, meditation, dhyana. So um, it says meditation is the bodhisattva's pure land. When the bodhisattva achieves Buddhahood, sentient beings who control their minds and keep them undisturbed come to be born in this country. Oh. So you have access to the pure land in your meditation. Keep meditating. Then wisdom. Prajna. Wisdom is the Bodhisattva's pure land. When the Bodhisattva achieves Buddhahood, sentient beings who have achieved correct concentration come to be born in this country. And in the four unlimited states, Brahma Viharas, so sympathy, compassion, joy, equanimity, that these are all uh, pure lands. These are all ways of gaining access to the pure land. So, again, a lot of these things we do now, right? These are practices we do now. So it's not... Um, you know, the enlightenment isn't something far remote that we have to you know, struggle a journey that we have to go towards. It's something we have right now and just have it turn towards it. It's over there and so I just have to look. You know. But I think a lot of the teaching here is to kind of shock us out of that idea that it's far away that we have to somehow prove our worth to someone else to get in. Um, and the entry is practice. The entry is if we do the practice, the Buddha responds and that pure land is available. So if you really do um, look for, you know, a practice space, um, you know, it could be a corner of your house while you're reading the sutra, I think. No, it could be the pure land. It could be, you know, a temple you visit. It could be your own practice space. It could be on the bus and you're meditating. Oh. <laughs> Next stop, Pure Land. Oh, good, yes. I got on the right bus. <laughs> Maybe it's not on Google Maps, though, so I don't know. Um, so then it says the four means of attraction 
are the Bodhisattva's pure land. When the Bodhisattva achieves Buddhahood, sentient beings who have been attracted through his emancipation come to be born in his country. Um, so what are the four means of attraction? Being generous, speaking kindly, and teaching the Dharma. So the Dharma shouldn't be, you know, yelled at you like a drill sergeant. That's not the proper way. Um, giving encouragement and setting an example. Uh, so it's a very gentle method. Um, so it's not you know, some YouTube video saying, you know, uh, 90, 90 minutes a day for 90 days to enlighten you or something, you know, <laughs> take this pill and you'll lose weight and achieve enlightenment. It's not, that's not the, the proper. <laughs> um, so there's all of these, you know, skillful means, 37 factors of enlightenment, explaining how to eliminate the eight difficulties, maintaining one's own practice of the precepts. All of these are go, go into more depth as we go through um, the text, but um, and, and covered in great depth. But w when I read this, it reminded me of, I'll tell you a story and then we'll finish for tonight. Um, so the city I lived in, in China, um, was very famous during the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. So it was a very, um, very famous for its steel production and um, mining and that kind of thing. So coal mine and steel production. So this was the kind of industrial center. Um, and a lot of other cities were told, you know, emulate this city. So people really tried hard to emulate that city. Um, and during the, um, because of that, a lot of cultural things, historic things were destroyed. Um, cause they were thought as, you know, backwards, this is getting in the, in the way of the revolution and that kind of thing. So when I visited, um, so that city's known for a couple things. That's where the last emperor was imprisoned. <laughs> um, and the prison's still there. You can go on a tour, see a cell. Very, very sad. Um, but above the prison, there's a hill. And that hill, there used to be uh, a nunnery. And when I was there, they were starting to rebuild it. Uh, and by that, I mean there was a pile of rubble and brick by brick. So the nun who lived there lived in a tent. Uh, you know, not a single one person Boy Scout tent, not like a big, not one of those uh, third world country relief tents that you walk around in, a real small tent. And she had a small table and there's some sutra books stacked up and a, you know, thermos of hot water, bowl, sleeping bag, that's it. Um, very happy to greet everyone and, um, you know, we s sat and chatted and talked about, you know, people who were donating and they were rebuilding the temple. And so I thought, oh, that was a pure land, right? That, no matter how humble, no matter how simple, no matter how much industrial activity and pollution was still being, you know, thrown out in the city below, on top of that hill, that moment, right? There was, there was practice. There was, um, you know, practice without, no pretense, no, you know, this wasn't going to be, um, there wasn't going to be any fancy carvings or, tile roof or anything. It was uh, very simple. But just to rebuild on that site and to have the Dharma kind of come back. Um, so that was a, in many ways like up your line. The city was also known for a young man named uh, Lei Feng and he was a model during uh, Cultural Revolution for being very giving, very generous and always thinking of others. And um, there's a whole Leifong Society and museum for Leifong. Um, but he was um, 21, 22. He was killed. Um, a truck backed up and hit him, and he, he died young. So they made him kind of like a martyr of the revolution. But what I always found um, kind of very nice about that one, it wasn't um, someone who died in battle. It wasn't somebody. He was doing like a regular community project. Um, and was known to kind of take especially young children and mentor them and, you know, get kids groups together and just like a really good kid. And he died, but I thought it was you know, very fascinating that the country made him, um, you know, this model. And even when I, I lived there, that was still sort of the ideal to be a student as good as him. So people wore buttons and um, it was very interesting. So I think um, both models, although coming from very different perspectives, showed a lot of sincerity. Um, and that's 
right? No matter what perspective you're coming from, um, sincerity is all you have to really remember. Um, when we go into the teaching, it's not to, at the end of the day, count, okay, how many times did I practice dhyana and vigor and, and <laughs> it's not to go through and make a list and force yourself. It's with sincerity, you naturally find yourself gravitating to those practices and it's just natural. That's the, the key. So when we say the bodhisattva acts in this way or practices in this way, they don't have to say, okay, well, you know, check the manual today. It's just this, this becomes natural. Um, and it's some blockage within us that obstructs it. And that's what our practice is aimed at. Um, getting rid of those obstructions, not to sort of artificially put it inside of us. I have to do this and this and this, because then it's not sincere. Right. It's only once we clear away the obstacles and then it just naturally flows. So I think you see this with very, really, very little kids, right? If another little kid falls down, they all go over and help, or like, oh, are you okay? You know? But sometimes there's some blockage within us that we laugh or say, oh, they deserved it, or something worse, right? We're the one that pushed them. <laughs> so, uh, New Year's resolution, sincerity. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and don't push the little kids down. <laughs> so shall we dedicate some merit? Very short, but as I said before, just like the Metta Sutta, we keep in mind uh, all beings having minds free of suffering, um, having the causes of happiness. Having more sincerity probably help our own country at the moment. So. <laughs> May these merits be shared by all beings everywhere so that all of us together may attain supreme awakening. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some chocolate, so I think we need to eat before. Uh, <laughs> Too long. Yeah. So it's good diver. It's good stuff. March fifth is Lei Hong Day in China now. Yeah, they were gonna make it a, uh, a state holiday. I had the button. I read. I went to the museum. And I read about his life, and um, you got a button. Mm hmm. I feel it was very inspiring, you know, it was, it was a nice, a lot of the um, Cultural Revolution heroes, uh, it's kind of questionable or um, you think, mm, maybe not so good, but it was, you know, it's hometown and um, so I wore the button, it was very interesting because um, every class had a Communist Party representative, and so the party rep sat in front and, you know, was made sure everyone was there and took attendance. Um, and I came in to class to teach that day and I was wearing the button and people noticed and they were like, oh, Right? They really were like, oh, you know, and do you know who Lei Fang is? And do you know why? It, it was like, people were very still inspired. And I think probably, you know, all the things from that time, for some reason, his model uh, persists. Um, and people don't feel like it's too corny or, you know, too much propaganda. I think partially because you know, he was very young. Um, and even in town, you know, you have people who remember, you know, oh, we remember when that, you know, kid was killed and it was just tragic. Um, but for some reason we don't have, we could use some models like that, you know, <laughs> these days. So, but anyway, I digress. So. <laughs> Thank you.